we pray. Lord Jesus, Prince of Peace and Lord of all creation, open our hearts to your word and open your word to our hearts. Amen. What a world. There's trouble in the Middle East between Israel and her neighbours. There's trouble in Europe with violent tussles over the territory of Ukraine. There's trouble in China with an all-powerful autocrat at the helm of that enormous country. Does that sound familiar? It should, except I've just described the world as it was around the time of the birth of Jesus Christ. Then it was the Roman subjugation of Israel that was often violently challenged and even more violently suppressed. In what is modern day Ukraine, the centuries before Christ saw the Scythians violently displaced by the Greeks and then the Greeks violently displaced by the Romans who were the dominant colonial power in that part of the world too by the year of Jesus' birth. And in China, the imperial intrigues around the supreme rule of Emperor Ai and the territorial ambitions of his Han dynasty look remarkably similar to the character and intentions of Xi Jinping and his imperial court today. Billy Graham once said that if an alien visited Earth, he would conclude that our principal business was war. Of the last 4,000 years of human history, only around 300 contain no historical record of any war. We long for the unity of humankind, but our default setting seems to be one of alienation. We long for peace, but the resentment and selfishness that makes people enemies seems to come far more naturally to us, all the way from the playground to the family of nations. We want our children to grow up, to be noble, kind, hardworking, honest, and yet a realistic assessment of our own moral achievements would make it far more likely that they will just find ways of repeating our own evil behaviours, alienation, enemies, evil, they're all ugly words. And I wonder if you noticed, and I'll be impressed if you did, I'll give you an extra chocolate by the door if you honestly confess that you did notice this, I wonder if you noticed that those three words all occurred in one sentence used by the Apostle Paul in our last reading from his letter to the Colossians. This is what he said, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. The apostle of Christ, as in the whole Bible story that we outline in this service of lessons and carols, locates the ultimate problem, not in our alienation from each other, but from our creator not in the way we are see, seem to be trapped in permanent enmity with others, but rather in our settled rebellion against the God who made us. And why do we rebel? So that we can justify our own moral choices. I don't mind having 10 commandments as long as I get to choose which ones. But when God tells me what to do and I don't want to do it, then I will justify myself make him my enemy and be estranged from my maker. This is the world of our first reading in Genesis 3. Uh, we sin, we blame the wife, and the lush harmony of the garden is gone. And with our fundamental relationship broken, what do we humans do as history unfolds? Well, let's just say our track record of creating a godless utopia hasn't exactly panned out yet. We keep trying. The next government, the next revolution, the next relationship, the next breakthrough. But the reality is that our alienation from God alienates us from those others he made in his image. Our enmity with him leaves us estranged from each other as well. 
When we reject his command to love him, we also reject his command to love our neighbours. And yet we long for peace. We long for a different story. We long for a peace maker. That's the Christmas story. There is one. He's come and he has made peace. This is the Christian hope. This is what makes the angel's announce announcement good news of great joy. It's not the diagnosis of alienation that brings joy, but it is necessary if the gospel message is to do its healing and joyful work in our hearts. For Christ comes to reconcile us to the God from whom we have alienated ourselves. This is the story of the whole Bible. Even there, back in Genesis 3, the hopeful note sounds, a devil crusher will come. Oh, his victory will come at the ultimate price. Isaiah 9 opens with our present situation, gloom and distress, humiliation and darkness. And again, the hope of a peacemaker brings honour and light, joy and victory over the oppressor. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and he will be called Prince of Peace. At the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. This is why Jesus Christ came. He was born to bring you and I peace. Micah too sounds that hope-filled note. Out of little Bethlehem will come one whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. His greatness will be reach the ends of the earth and he will be their peace. And so Christ finally comes and the angels sing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. The peacemaker has come. And that's what makes it good news of great joy that is for all the people. Because today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you and he is Christ the Lord. Let me come back to Paul who spells out the connection for us. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now God has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Here is the peace we long for, reconciliation with God through the death of the Christmas child. In him, we are no longer rejected, but now presented holy and acceptable to our maker in the heavenly court. In him, our sins are gone. We are free from any accusation standing against us, not because we are sinless, but because he has crushed the accuser and paid in full by his willing self-sacrifice the price of our rebellion. So why is the world unchanged? A tyrant still threatens Ukraine. Gloom and distress are so often still our lot. Well, John tells us, at the start of his gospel, although the true light has come into the world he had made, we neither recognise nor receive him. So what then must now change? We must. We may give a gift, but if it is not received, there is no blessing. To my shame, I recently discovered a Christmas card from last year, unopened, buried on my office desk that my wife had given me to pass on. I failed. The moment passed. I quietly put it in the bin. What a shame. Don't do the same with the peacemaking, life-changing hope that Jesus Christ holds out to you in his gospel. For as John continues in his famous prologue, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Friends, will you do that? Perhaps do it afresh or do it for the first time. Recognise the Prince of Peace. Trust him as your saviour. Bow down to him as your king. Worship him as your God. It is the way and the only way into the family of God. And once we receive this gift, it or rather he begins to change us. For we who have been forgiven 
must be the first to forgive. We who have been reconciled must be the first to initiate reconciliation, even at great cost. We who were once enemies of God and are commanded to love our enemies. We who have been shown mercy are now called to be those who show mercy to others. Paul applies the same logic if you read his whole letter. Uh, having said, uh, spoken of the peace we have with Christ the reconciler, he then applies it. Let that peace of Christ rule in your hearts, he says, as it flows out into your relationships and your sphere of influence. Christ was born to bring you peace with God and to enable you to be a peacemaker. Receive him, trust him, and he will be your peace, even yours. It all starts here. Once you were alienated, now God has reconciled you. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. Or as we've already sung together this evening, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. Amen.